Oh, is, saying, is, is that co-present? Uh, yep, it is. Co-present is yep. the one. Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so my topic on my talk, I changed it. So it's now uh, from source code to containers. So it should be quite self-evident what this is about. A uh, little bit about me. I'm Chris Hang. I'm from uh, PyCo. I do DevOps there. Basically, I'm a dev who pretends to be ops. So. <laughs> And we make a chat app forward. So you can check it out on the web, app store, or Google Play. So, yeah, that's the end of that. So, let's start off with a simple topic uh, creating containers. And you, you've probably seen this before. How, to, how do you create a container for a, a process for executable? So, it's very easy. You just pick a base. Uh, maybe it's Ubuntu or you use Debian. And then you install the process and run it in the foreground. For example, uh, this example is about Nginx. Uh, use app get to install Nginx and then you define like, things like say multiple directories, the working directory, the default command, and then it runs in the foreground so you can set the uh, daemon to off. Then you do things like expose the port. Then you just run the image. So that's simple enough. It's even easier if you have a statically linked executable. Then you don't even need the OS at all. You just save from scratch and then you add the executable into the image and that's it. So it's a minimum Docker image which is only like 3 megabytes, 4 megabytes. But if you can do this, then why not just run it without a container? So chances are your normal the normal applications that you actually want to Dockerize are much more complex than this. So let's actually pick a real world example, a web app. So our choice is this. How many of you know about Ferro? Okay. So it's bleeding edge PHP forum software. It's okay. very new. And I picked this because it's actually quite a complex application. So some, some considerations. Now this application is uh, it's new, it's in active development. There are feature branches, there are frequent commits. So developers and testers, so if they're using a Docker image uh, with this application inside it, they will want to work on a local checkout of the source code. But regular users, they don't want to bother with all that. They just want to just download a container, run it, and it just works. They just want to try it out. Uh, people who actually want to run the application, they will need stable or version releases. And certain users, they may want to uh, use latest nightly builds, for example. So for that scenario, uh, you can have an all-in-one approach. You just pack everything into a single distribution container. So this works well for users who just want to try it out. So Docker pull the image, run it without any parameters, and it just works. So you can provide some additional customization parameters using environment variables. Or you can also do data retention. For example, if you start the container, you want the database the data to persist. Right? So you use volumes or mounts. But but in the application, it involves more than one process. Now, this is a PHP application, so it needs a database, right? So, Fabron requires PHP, not necessarily FPM, but yeah, this is what we use in our uh, example. MySQL or MariaDB, and also uh, web server Nginx or Apache. <coughs> so, multiple processors. You can, you can run multiple processors inside a container. Uh, this is according to the Docker dash themselves despite the single process per container philosophy. So in order to do that, you usually you need a unit system or a process supervisor. Right? So there, there's some uh, tutorials uh, or some examples where people actually use things like supervisor D, which is not ideal since it's not intended to be run as PID1. And there's also the zombie reading problem. So this has been detailed in a blog post, so you can look for it on Google. Uh, some people use R unit. For example, there's a very popular image called Fusion Base Image, uh, which actually uses a, a Python wrapper script around the R unit since it needs to handle environment variables. But uh, some people have come up with a new micro init system, a very lightweight init system called S6, and that recently updated, created a new project called S6 Overlay, which uh, adds some convenience wrappers around it. So that is what we'll use. And to not, uh, Note that to play nice with the Docker design, you should always designate, designate one particular process as the primary primary one in the container. That will cause the whole container to shut down if when it terminates. So for this, uh, maybe it will be the database or Nginx. 
So first you start by defining a base container. So, <laughs> we just use Alpine Linux for this. Uh, we use Alpine 3.2. And then we just directly add the assets overlay to it. And that's the extent of our base image. So you just obtain it directly uh, using, you get to just load the tarball into the image using add. And yeah, that's it. Just curious, how big is this image? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when it's so five megabytes plus for, for Kai's benefit. But uh, so so Anne actually extracts the top of it. Yeah, Anne will extract it. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. So if you don't want that to happen, you should use copy instead. So uh, this one I think was nine hundred KB when in the in the tarball. So uh, I'm not sure how big it is when it's extracted. But it's wait, not. Wait, 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 wait. You add that tarball into the root directory. Yes. And then you copy what's rootfs? Oh, rootfs is just uh, it just defines some empty directories. It's just a directory template. Since you have some like services dot d, some uh, so this is in your local thing. Yeah. So that directory structure is inside the file system. Actually, I can show it to you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's a bit small, but you can see some rootfs, etc, and then these are just placeholder directories. <coughs> this is just convention. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So etc and then you the the it's a bit obfuscated because if you're reading it you think what the hell is rootfs? Yeah, well rootfs is just a convention that says okay this is the layout of all the different directories etc or user or whatever that you just want to copy inside the container. But when it, but but uh, I'm trying to set up a file system hierarchy. Yeah, it, it has that. This is just you add on to the file system. You need right? Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. It's not a duplicate. Okay, yeah, yeah, just merging it in, yeah. So in, in the end, yeah, it's, you are just making directories, that's all. That's, that's what that command actually does. Right, some placeholder directories for your init files. So, um, so for the distribution mm -hmm. container, we will install everything that's actually required to run the Flarum release. So Nginx, uh, the database, and PHP. So you can see the commands here is basically just a shell script. Uh, in Alpine Linux, you use apk as a package manager. So apk add nginx php or the php extensions, MariaDB. Does not have the Axel or Axel MySQL in it? Uh, this is based on the the, the uh, repository of Alpine, so they only have MariaDB. Oh. Actually, if you add MySQL, that allows it, that allows it to MariaDB anyway. So. Okay. And then you do the same thing. Uh, in root fs, there is uh, another directory structure that contains all the configuration files. For example, php.ini is, is inside the PHP directory. So you just merge it in again. <coughs> this is just to save uh, lines inside the Docker file. So you can actually just add each file individually. And then you define the bind mount for the web app. Then you expose the web ports. And uh, some more points of convention for. If a process has additional uh, init in, in requirements, for example, one time setup and so on, the common practice is to prepare an entry point script which wraps the target process. So let's say uh, you, you say the command entry point and then you uh, refer to the script, and then this script can call exact whatever target process is. So that's, that's just convention. But since we're using an init system, and we already have an entry point which is our, our init, so we will actually use the run scripts per service as our entry points. So this is what the directory structure looks like. For Nginx and PHP, uh, the run script is straightforward, but for the database, you need first time setup. So every time it actually checks if the default database exists, if it doesn't, then it creates it using MySQL install DB. If the Flarum that the database doesn't exist, then you create it using all these scripts. <coughs> then only then, then you start the MySQL database. Actually, I, I was going to say I have the same problem with my own file. Uh, I mean, the password, how do you do the password? Okay, so if you need if to you add, add, you can do the envy there. Yeah, you can do environment variables. Yeah. You can pass it oh, in. Okay. Yeah. So, so this one is not cust very customizable, so you can improve it. So now you have a distribution container. What about developers? 
So developers are contributors that will wish to work on the checkout of the source code outside of the container. So in this case, it will be convenient to containerize just the development environment. So in addition to all the runtime dependencies, you have all the build tools, you have all the um, compilation tools. So you can run all these tools inside the container, it reduces wrap up time, doesn't pollute the host machine, and then you bind mount application code when you run the container. So if you look at the application, we have all these uh, processes, and then you see all these dependencies. You have Composer, you have Git, Subversion, Node.js, Gulp, all this. All these bloated tools to run modern web apps on. So you will need a build process, right? And Flarum, I chose this because it actually has a very complex, a rather complex build process. It uses Composer to pull PHP libraries, then it uses another package manager called Bower to pull JavaScript libraries, then it uses Gulp to compile and identify less and ES6 JavaScript modules. And in addition, it has support for, it has some support for extensions. And extensions are just repositories with the same build process as this. So you have to run this same build process in all those extensions. And then after producing our CSS and JavaScript output files, then you don't actually need those dependencies anymore. So we can isolate this build process into another container. Right. So the workflow looks like this. You spin up the builder container, which contains all your build tools, and you mount your source directory into that container. Then you execute the scripts to build your application, which produces uh, some output like the CSS and JS. Then you remove the builder container. Now you, you still have a source directory, which is already built. Then you spin up the runtime container and then bind mount the produce build. Right. We now have multiple build steps, so now we use a make file to organize it. Right. So this is the actual build step. But before that, we need uh, we actually need a Ferrum Dark Tree. Right. So this will run the build container, which downloads the source code, builds the Ferrum directory. And then start uh, assets. And after that, when this is done, this dependency is done, then only then it runs a runtime container with the my mounted application code. What, what, so, I, I okay, have, so. I have a quick question. So, after it builds, right, um, how do you get out the source file? Uh, the, the oh, with the mount, the okay, okay. previous volume mounted, is it? Yeah, so this is a new step. You actually run the Docker container with the build. Mm -hmm. Container, you bind mount the source directory. This is a source directory into the build directory inside the container itself. As a volume, as a volume, yes. Oh, okay. Then inside here, this this is actually a bind mount which contains the build script. Mm -hmm. So this is your build script. This is your source code. You run the build script upon your source code. The build script isn't a main file. <coughs> oh my god! It's, it's just a regular script. Yeah, you can expand okay. upon it as you wish to. Oh. Uh, okay. So if, if it fails, you just look in the directory and see yeah. what's happened. Just the RM removes the rest of the environment, basically. Yeah. How do you get a correct user? Because if we use create files, it's created as root. Uh, it's created as root, yeah. So how do you operate on these files outside? It's, it's not owned by your... The doctor is using the volume of that right? That it's, it's root inside the doctor, right? The UID here, the UID here is... The UID zero is normally root, right? So... When you view the file, you find the output directory of the root. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which means you can't normally like delete the file or just operate on the because you're not owned by your current user. You probably inside the container. Yeah. Inside the container is zero, but when it actually spits it out, the proper is putting it out as your UID. So the, 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 oh, the directory is fine because, 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 because of the volume one. Yeah. All right. As a user, this yeah. speeds out as a user. UID. Uh, if you run as a root, the Docker daemon always runs as root. All this command just calls the API of the daemon. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, well, what's the problem? They just need to see each other. Yeah, as you can see, later we still have to do something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So this is what the partial build script looks like. It's actually a rather long build script, so because you have to handle each extension separately. So well this, this is, is the Flarum build script, is it? Flarum, yeah. From 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 the from This is actually adapted script. from their own build script, so yeah. 
So you have run Composer, you run uh, Bower, you run NPM, Gulf, and so on. So it's quite quite a lot of steps. So now you have a uh, working uh, build process. So what happens when you put your containers on production? So now the containers will change again. They might change. The process distribution will largely depend upon your architecture and your requirements, for example. Uh, you don't want to put your like, database inside a container, for example. So you re remove MariaDB and then you use a centralized database service, AWS, RDS, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you may, you may want to remove Nginx and use a dedicated container with Nginx for load balancing. Mm -hmm. So there may still be a use case for multiple processors. For example, if you want to run PHP, cron, and syslog together, then yeah, you still use a unique system. And in this case, since now you have multiple containers with different processes inside them, you have to use you have to achieve uh, communication between them using links or some DNS-based service discovery, for example, console or overlay networking. But this is outside the scope of the talk, so it's, there's a lot to talk about this. Right. Uh, actually, yeah. Let's just show what happens. So now we have. Uh, Probably not going to show you the build itself because it actually takes a long time. But yeah, this is what the output looks like. So it's building. Then when it's finished, then when you actually run the container, then it actually sets up the database. So it says it didn't find find the parent database, so it's running the setup. Then it creates the default tables. Then it starts accepting connections. So this is nginx. So when I visit. The site itself, yeah, you can see it's running. But how do you test? How do you, how do you like make a decision whether to roll it out into production? So that's another thing. Um, right now, I don't see many examples of people actually testing their containers. Mm -hmm. So the only example I've seen is like if anybody knows who Program is. Program. Program, yeah, it creates, uh, I think, a loader container. So it, it, this is the one who created, uh, I forgot what name it was. Uh, but yeah, it's a centralized logging uh, container for Docker. And it also does quite a lot of interesting things as well. He actually created something called Bash Team, which is a library which lets you test uh, using Bash scripts. So you can use that uh, to test your containers, to test whether services were installed correctly, and yeah, all those. I have a question. So, if what happens if the build fails? Uh, it will speed up error because uh, uh -huh. I turn on as uh, basically line by line output. So. Oh, into the volume that you know that is that right? Yeah, you are actually operating upon the your host, your host machine, or the directory on the host machine. Okay. So if it stops halfway, then basically it's built halfway as well. Then, then maybe you need something like a clean target to clean the directory and start over. So it's still manual, so you have to, yeah. Right, right. But I mean, like, how, how, how do you identify like, the, 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 the failure of the build and things like that? Oh, uh, it will output an error code, then you can check for it. It will tell you. Where will it output? To a file or it will output to. to uh, the, like... the Docker container will quit. Uh huh. And then. Uh, then, you, then when it clicks, you can actually check the error code. You can actually program it, you program program it yeah. Basically, bash is in with dash in dash x, dash x, right? Bash is in with dash e for uh, for on any error code, basically stops, right? Everything stops, yeah. and it propagates the error return code up, right? Yeah. And dash x basically shows everything that's happening line by line, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, yes. Probably something like uh, yeah, that's fine. I couldn't find it anymore. But yeah, anyway, uh, if that's an error, then you receive the it will propagate outwards. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to this. So now you know how to create containers. So now you dockerize uh, complex web application. So what happens when you have to maintain it when there are updates? And not just application code updates as well. There could be OS updates, there could be system package updates, security patches, and so on. Well, the usual process is to just rebuild the base images and redeploy all your containers. 
but there are some issues you probably have noticed. By now we have Docker files, shell scripts, make files. And Docker files themselves are also essentially shell scripts. So isn't this a regression? I mean, we have, there's, we have all these tools, uh, config management tools, you know, Ansible, shell, Chef, Puppet, all this. But we are back to using shell scripts. Yes. It's expanded, it's faster. Yeah, but it's still, also if, still, if you're working in a team or with lots of developers or let's say open source project, then basically everybody is it's just free form code basically. So there's less structure to it, it's a bit primitive. You can turn out we have maintenance not made because you can see the length of that build script just now. And also, can I quickly upgrade the package without having to review the whole image? I say you want to patch open SSL in multiple images. And even before that, how do you determine which images need updates? Right? If you look at the output of Docker images, I say uh, Ferrum image, can you tell me which what packages are installed inside? I use Docker inspect. So, it doesn't really tell me anything. There's, also, there's this feature called labels, which were actually re added recently, but you still have to do custom scripting to get any information in there. Right. You can't determine directly from most Docker files. People don't usually do dependency cleaning or whatever. So, you can't really inspect the file system to check which version you have installed. So, it's a problem. So. In this case, why not treat your containers like actual hosts? Then you enter, inspect your containers, update each container, and co commit changes back to the image. That's, no, that's more complicated, isn't it? Well, that depends. Uh, if your images are small enough, if you don't have a lot of images, then basically you just set up an automated build on Docker Hub, for example. Then whenever you update, then they just rebuild. But how, how, do you know, how do you know the update is in time? That's up to the tool you use. But well, I'll, I'll go to that later. You can use try the tested tools. Uh, Ansible. Mm. Yeah. Well, we, we, for this talk, we'll focus just on Ansible. So you can, you can see how we approach it. <laughs> oh, yes. no, no, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but at this point, you're wondering Ansible works for SSH, right? And most containers don't include the SSH data. Oh. There's a CH root connection option, but there's no implementation examples. Nobody has done it. It's probably also a really bad idea to mess around in the Docker library, uh, the Docker folders. <laughs> but still, this problem will be solved with 2.0. So it has a Docker connection. Yeah. And this was merged like 20 days ago, so it's quite, still quite new. But it's still in alpha, so you have to install and run as you go from source currently. So instead of using SSH to connect to a running container, and simple scripts will be executed using Docker as well. And inventory host names will map to your Docker container names. So you can do things like uh, static container inventory. So instead of saying and simple connection goes local, you can say it goes Docker. Or you can do ad hoc container inventory. You spin up a container and then you just run the ad host command. So. Then you can target it as a regular host. Updating images, then you can run the playbook. So it's just a regular playbook. And then you can just specify connection is Docker. Then pre tasks, yeah, this is just how you organize your playbook. You can organize it this way. The pre, you start a base container, and then you do whatever you want to update open, uh, open as itself, for example. Then after that, you commit it to an image. How do you restart the so, service? So. You can put it in your post task. The, yeah, in your post. So after you have committed it, then you restart the service. Or that, that, begins, oh, that can be a separate oh, build. This is like an Ansible thing. This one just updates the image itself. For restarting the containers, you can have a different playbook, for example. Yeah. Oh my god, here I am. Yep. 
So some things, you know, all operations are saved as a single image layer. But if we smaller base images, this isn't such a big deal. So, and you also need Python to actually run Ansible. So it will add 30 megabytes to your base image size. So this may be a showstopper. And that's configuration drift. Since now, eventually, since now your image is actually different from your Docker file. So eventually you need to reconcile. But if you can update images with Ansible, why not create them with Ansible? Oh no. Oh, I didn't. Right, so you start the base container, and yeah, it's basically the same thing. So you just start off with a base container that has a Python yeah. install. You showed the role as you are updating OpenSSL, right? Yeah, and the role itself will contain tasks. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like, it will contain tasks. You, you, you can do whatever, right? Yes. But when you do update OpenSSL, do you know what version you are installing? How, yeah, you, how, that will be, how do you control the version? That would be part of your task. The task you can say, first, find out the uh, current install version of OpenSSL. If it's not fitting a certain version, then you say, okay, then install. Then you do five minutes. Yeah, uh, your entire argument for using this was that you don't know what the version inside is, right? Yeah. And then how does Ansible tell you which version you're going to install? Because you are doing latest, right? Yeah, then, 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 then that's up to you to script. And I say you, you want to specify, okay, this is the version I want. Then it goes in each, it, into each container and then says, okay, checks the current version and then installs if, if it's different or it's too old. I mean, so right now, the, the idea is to have item potent updates. Yes, but right now, right now it only does latest from, from, from all the Ansible that I have used. There's still that you, don't, you actually don't know what version it's on. You just know it's the latest of what your OS is uh, installing, right? You can specify the version. Well, that's up to you also. If you, if you just use your package, package manager, then uh, and install the latest one, but if you build it from source for example, that's different. Yeah. Okay. There's also some alternative solutions. If you don't use Ansible tool, there's Dockerflow, which is even a more uh, manual version of which with Ansible play with that target Docker host, it dumps the table into shell scripts, dumps them onto the container and then executes them. So yeah, same as previous. And that's also Hacker. So this is a uh, tool from the same people who brought you Vagrant. It's a machine image reader, and you can output Docker images as well. It's been, it, it, it already has this ability since a long time ago, actually. And it has support for provisioners, uh, all this Ansible, Share, Puppet, and so on. Although it doesn't support additional image metadata, so you still have to specify them with runtime <coughs> So that's the one thing it doesn't support yet. And this is an example, it just uses the regular JSON. Uh, so the output is actually a tarball, so you have to use docker import to put it into your registry. So summary. Uh, when you create your docker images, uh, there are different considerations depending on the different environments and different architectures. So define your base images, whether you want a single process or you want to run multiple processes with an init system. So during the development stage, you would have uh, development image with all the build tools with bind mounted source code or you can separate, isolate your development image into a builder image so it just runs a build process and in production then you, want, then you have a distribution image with the source code inside or you can separate them out into single process images with links or other ways to communicate between containers so how our workflows has evolved so we started out with simple Docker files, yeah, which is nice. But the thing is, people think they are simple because all this time they've been building relatively simple applications. But you have seen, once we get into complex applications, then it gets really big. Now you have to separate your Docker commands into shell scripts. Then you have to mount them, and then you have to run build processes and so on. So it get, gets really complicated. So why not replace them with configuration management for better structure, reusability and maintainability? So that's something you can consider. And this, this is why I think uh, existing tools are still very much relevant, right? And just because you have Docker files doesn't mean you can that doesn't mean you have to throw away all the knowledge you have of Ansible or configuration management. And actually I expect a shift away from complex Docker files as people start dockerizing more and more complex applications. 
due to maintainability and security concerns. Right now, there's a lot of images on the Docker Hub that are not very well maintained, so and there's very little visibility into what is actually inside the image itself. So, yeah, maybe, yeah, we can achieve some kind of happy balance if we make use of these configuration management management tools. Yep. So that's it. Thank you very much. Are you taking out by any production? Yes, I am. Actually, yeah, that, that's something, and uh, there's some things to note if you use Alpine. Uh, right now, there's one big problem if you want to say use uh, DN service discovery using DNS, for example, console, because Alpine the DNS resolution is problematic. It's actually broken, as some people like to say. So some people have workarounds that use some like DNS mask inside the container itself, or that. Actually, install GDC. What's the DNS GDC? Like the one job style? What do you mean? Ah, uh, GDS. It's a bit primitive. It doesn't support search domains, for example. Things like that. So it's search domains for losers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't know much about it. But I know it gives problems to people who try to use things like console. So yeah, you need to have workarounds. Right? And how you feel basically the build? Uh, over file, right? So, would it be more accessible to have, for example, you import everything to Git and you just mount it and basically you build your container directly without the building script because you mount all the source code? As in, you mount it on Git? Yeah, for example, you, you take the same the application, this PHP application from GitHub, yeah. so you git it in your local PC. And then just you create a container directly with a, you don't need to build it because you can build directly. Oh, you mean use use host machine to host build machine, yeah. yeah, you can do that as well. Okay. Yeah, but that, that depends on each individual developer whether they want to put all the build tools on their machine or maybe uh, it's a, maybe a stream example, but maybe they have conflicts between different versions of uh, development environments, different versions of let's say Node.js for example. Yeah, so, yeah. so what's the benefit for building on, 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 on the container? Like doing all the building and I assume testing is good, running okay, the scripts and everything in the Docker container. Sorry. <coughs> it's something I didn't touch on, but once you have this in place, right? That means everything is running on perfectly portable. That means now instead of building a container, now you can offload it to, uh, let's say, some kind of yeah, continuous integration server. So basically, now you have the tools to build your application basically anywhere. So you say Docker thing. All right, yeah. Uh, don't you think that uh, all these things that you showed just now is an attempt to treat containers as virtual machines? Yeah. 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 Mm, so, like, kind of, yeah. it's in an attempt to bring the old practices that work for virtual machines onto a new paradigm of containers, is, don't you think that that's what it is? Uh, well, that's... You don't... That's arguable. I mean, you still have the... You are still like weights. I mean, you are still, you're just running multiple processes. It's a container for those, right? If you just want to have a single container, actually, you don't need to do any Docker or any Docker files and portals. I think it's just a way to build the image differently. It's just a matter of organization, actually. So, I mean, you are still isolating your dependencies. Uh, so, it's. I guess it makes some things possible. For example, uh, how do you solve the problem of having a syslog inside the container? You still have to run both of, both processes at the same time. So, yeah. No, I'm not talking about uh, running multiple processes in the I'm talking about trying to upgrade an existing container instead of rebuilding it. Isn't this an approach that works for virtual machines and the approach that is not suitable for containers? Basically immutable. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, in case, that yeah, means it doesn't scale that approach, obviously. And the yeah, issue probably. is that we lose, we kind of lose that benefit of containers 
which gives us same reproducible, exactly the same reproducible environment in development, testing, staging, and production. Exactly. Yeah, that's one thing. So it depends on your needs. Like if you say if it's, if it's an emergency security patch, for example, and then building your con all your containers takes a while, then what? maybe this can be a stopgap measure. But I mean, uh, this doesn't necessarily just apply to updating. For example, I just show you how to create a container. So uh, you can still use, you can still apply the principle of immutability. So it, this is just a tool to help you structure your code. So it's not just necessarily for for operations. <coughs> so. Do you use posh your images after the whole Ansible thing? Uh, sorry? Do you use posh your images after the whole Ansible thing? Yeah, you push. Posh, posh, posh. As in, like, get, get, rid of, get rid of the layers. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's up to the developer, I guess. So, um, okay. I mean, with us, uh, well, if you squash them, basically, I'm merging all the layers, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, whether it's because we are using, if if you are using a small base image in the first place, then it doesn't really make too much of a difference anyway. So, yeah. I mean, if if it's a small image, then I mean, if you define a base image, right? Uh, that's that's small, and then after that you, the, you create several containers for different services or for different applications. Usually, those containers don't share too much of their layers in the first place. So, whether whether uh, you define incremental layers or whether it's quashing the single layer, it's small anyway, so it doesn't really matter too much. Oops, sorry. Uh, well, I also just found it weird how you want to reuse Ansible and puppet skills. I mean, what happens if you have a developer who doesn't, who has good taste, and doesn't like Ansible and puppet, and has never touched such bullshit in their lives, and he comes into your team? I mean, dude, less is more. Uh, some people like uh, shell scripts, I guess. Uh, no, shell. I've been a programmer for at least a year of my life. No, um, I. <laughs> <laughs> I've been. A, I've had a not a very long career, but I can tell you, man, shell scripts are always going to be there. Man. It's always going to be there. I don't see how it's ever going to change. Mm -hmm. Especially when there's like bullshit like Ruby and Perl and things like that that come along to, to, to try to replace it. Everything to a static Well, for something that's, that's entirely custom, like for example the build process, you, you're probably not going to put that into Ansible. So, yeah, also, in case, you, you if I see someone who's not using shell on their command line, then I might be, then I, you can prove me wrong. I've never seen that. <laughs> so, let's, let's move on to the sort of thing. Shell is the, the basic thing that every, every top, uh, DevOps person must know. Yeah. Okay, that's one viewpoint. Just don't think it's a good idea to go to the container and update on a per container basis. That, 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 that just strikes me as really Yeah, it's probably not. Because if you have like 100 containers, for instance, and you want to update all of them, then how, how can you ensure that the update will be applied by consistently throughout all these types of data, all these kind of containers? Well, that, that's what Ansible is for, actually. So. Right, but what you could do is you could just build an image with the update and then push the update as a layer to all of the 100 containers. Then for sure that you know that all these, all these 100 containers are running the same images. Yeah, I mean that, that's better if yeah if you're running the same containers everywhere then that's probably more more effective. So yeah, it heavily depends on the use case. Uh, I was gonna say this is probably a stupid question, but if you want to rebuild I, I only usually run a couple of Docker images which are uh, unique and when I upgrade them it's usually quite simple. But if you're doing it on a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of Docker images or whatever uh, how do people automatically like you know say you like you do a git push of your docker image and you need all your containers to to basically um, rebuild themselves and shut down what do people what, what's this, what is what is the solution for that use yeah. 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 there, there are a lot of solutions for that so what is what is UCA say for for example, it's totally different Docker. It, it, it's a Docker thing, or is it like a, it's 
kind of put up with him, yeah. Did you guys, did you guys use it, or was it like yeah, we used it? Okay, you, 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 Anyway, uh, just to add on to you just now, um, when you mentioned updating all those containers, right? What I showed just now was actually not that. That was not actually to go into each container and then do an update inside the container. It's actually to spin up a new container just to update the image. Yeah. Then once you update the image, then you push it out. Yeah. So you spin up a container to update the image, to push the image, and then replace all the containers with a new image. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. It's just a method method of updating an image. Yeah. Yeah. But it's probably still best to rebuild from scratch, right? It's, yeah, it's better. Are you using that Flarum in your company or something? No, it's just for some interest. <laughs> a yeah, just, just a like, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I wouldn't touch a complex app. Can you build <laughs> your own systems? It's like something from the 90s. Holy crap! <laughs> It looks a lot at this course, yes. Is it better than this course? Because this course, I think I checked it out, it was a billion lines of code. And then I, and then I tweeted at Coding Horror saying you're an idiot. And then he said something worse to me. <laughs> Uh, maybe you can just give us an example on how you update uh, code when you want to release a new, when you deploy a new release in, in your company. Oh, um, oh, you mean inside the company? Yeah, let, let's say uh, your, your server has a new version and then you want to deploy that. Oh, uh, in this case, we actually build distribution containers, we actually put the source code in, the, the, one, the built source code inside a base container that just contain, that contains the runtime dependencies. So it's probably a runtime container, it contains a source code, and we just push it, push the entire container out to our uh, raising deployment. So we just replace the container. Uh, it's just uh, the regular deployment process. So do a live update of your production server now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, right. I mean, how do you actually know that like Alpine has updated a crucial package? Is there like a because Debian has a security mm -hmm. bulletin thing? Uh, does Alpine even have that? I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, get it? Something that actually has ha has a Alpine has something. Yeah, but not, not like a you will not get a consistent change log, but they continuously keep updating that. Like the beginning Yeah, but that's for every package, isn't it? You want maybe you only want to update when there's security problems. But I don't know. Yeah. How how long do you yeah. take to set everything up? Like to build everything and, and, and oh. all the processes and everything. For this particular project? Yeah. Uh, two days I guess. Yeah, I wasted a few hours just to get MariaDB working because uh, apparently if you leave it as a default settings then there is actually an entry in the user's table, a default entry which is an uh, empty username and localhost mm -hmm. and it prevents you from logging in as another user with localhost. <laughs> so things like that. <laughs> Think about uh, customizing the same image. For example, if you supply the MySQL uh, username and password the environment, then it stops using the MySQL inside, something like that. If you, if you have an entry point, right, you could actually do that. Yeah, you can, yeah. Basically, you just set up your entry point so that it accepts all the environment variables yeah. that you pass in your container, then you yeah, can basically customize using your password and all this stuff. If a new developer joins your team, uh, what would be the uh, efficient learning curve? 
Okay, uh, so well, then there will still be a learning curve, just that it is much easier to for the initial setup. So the, the the important thing here is that they can actually see something running immediately. Yeah. So it's basically like uh, as a developer, you can comfortably. Uh,